Welcome to the Automators Podcast with your host, Jackie Stook and Joe Glines. Today, we're going to cover 10 steps to build a strong consulting business. Awesome, man. Let's do it. Hey, everybody. It's Jackie from Copenhagen with... I'm Joe from Dallas, Texas. Yeah, and today we're going to cover... 10 steps you need to build a strong, vibrant consulting business. Yeah, so we have these 10 points here. And the first one is have a place they can go to learn more about you. You know, have a website, have have some presence somewhere where people can actually learn about you. Just trying to be word of mouth or, or whatever you would call that probably won't work in the same way today as it once did. People will expect to somehow be able to look you up. Yeah, and, and let me re reiterate on that is, often what will happen is that let's say I'm looking to find someone to do something for me. And I might ask Jack, Jackie, do you know anyone that knows how to you know rebuild a car in the scene? Yeah, I do, it's, it's this guy. What's my next step? You know, I might call him, but probably I'm going to Google him first and see if I can find more information about him just to kind of flesh him out a little bit. And that's where you can have like a Facebook page, a business page or a LinkedIn business page, but I'd still recommend having a website. It's just yeah. much more professional and, and makes you feel like you're legitimate. Yeah, and it can be done for such a low price point or you can use a free service if you want to De depends on 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 how you uh, yeah what you feel is best yeah uh, the next one would be it's a really important step and i tried always to do it when i worked in market research and in uh technology but to be consultative so when someone comes to you and says joe i want i want to do this you know take a step back <laughs> And really ask some really good questions and really confirm that because often what they say they want to do isn't really the right thing to do. Often it's something it's close, but it's not quite the best approach. And sometimes you can find a better. Now, a good example of this was I had a up in Oklahoma, my house, I, I had a plumber come out and I was going to have him install some French drains in the backyard because the backyard always flooded. And he said, well, I could, you know, come out and dig these, you know, things and it would drain. But it's still going to be terrible because you don't have gutters on your roof and the gutters are actually why is why your backyard's flooding. So he's like, just install gutters and the whole thing goes away. And I, I was so overjoyed. I'm like, dude, this is awesome. You know, let me, let me pay you for your time coming out. And he wouldn't let me even pay him for coming out and he doesn't do gutters. Right. But to me, I told him like, you got my business now for life, right? As long as I have a house here, I'll be calling you because. He purposely turned away, you know, directed me to a different solution that wasn't even his. And it just really makes you feel like you're dealing with someone honest. It's looking out for you. Yeah, absolutely. Some something like this is if you're if you're consulting them on automation, uh, use your experience and guide them as best you can, because uh, you'll either get a customer who will stay for longer or uh, you'll really really have make their day and they'll more than likely come back and ask you for advice in the future. And and that's also one of the reasons we have the first point or the third point here is have testimonials, right? If people have had a good experience with you consulting them, uh, get that written down make them do a testimonial so that you can actually show it to other people and i know for a fact that when looking at other consultants or if i don't know even if you're looking at a hotel reviews stuff like that people's opinions or reviews or testimonials if they seem legit they just have such a great value. Absolutely. I, I do give a lot of um, trust into other users' opinions. That's awesome, Jackie. So uh, years ago, years and years ago, I read this book, The Death of Advertising, The Rise of PR, something pretty close to that by Jack Trout. I think it was his daughter co-authored that one. But he it's a lot about credibility. And in advertising and marketing, I'm telling you how great I am, right? And like back on my website, I'm telling you how great I am. There's only so much credibility, right? Because you're like, well, you're saying you're the one telling me. But when someone else tells 
you know, you hear, even if you don't even know them, if you know them, it's the, suddenly the credibility really goes up on that source, right? But even if you don't know them and you see other people saying that this person is legit, it's so much more trust, so much more credibility in what they say. And that's why PR, that kind of stuff approach works a lot, a lot better than paid advertising. So yeah, it's, it's a huge, and they're so easy to do, right? And here's the thing. If you can't get some testimonials, you're probably not, you know, a, a, a good person to be doing the work, right? Was what it boils down to, which is, yeah. I don't want to hire someone that can't give me one or two people that they've worked with. Now, now another great one is, is provide as close as relative examples as you can, you know, to other work you've done. Sometimes it's a little tricky because the other work you've done is confidential and you can't share it. Or maybe you can reach out to a client and say, hey, I have someone who's trying to do this. Can I show him a little bit about what we did, Right. But it, the closer you can make it, the examples you're providing, or just having a conversation with them and show them you're a knowledge expert, right? That really helps a lot of people to understand that you're an expert in that area. Yeah, yeah that, that's a great one. Just being able to actually show why you will be able to uh, consult them in, in the area that you're doing. Absolutely, with, with relative uh, examples. That's, <laughs> yeah, you, if you can't, do that, it, it will be a bit harder for you to actually keep them on. I think. I'll say I'll take the next one as well here. Have like something extra they'll get if they choose you. You know, like having a bonus. Um, they'll they'll love you for it. it. It can be in automation. It can be some tool you've written or some white paper you have or some extra steps, whatever you have a list of, of stuff, it can be all kinds of stuff. But having that extra thing you can send them or give them or tell them, it, it's of great value. Yeah, and it's actually, there's a lot going on with it, but uh, a simple one, like in market research, what people would do is they would, let's say you have like a 40 minute study and you'd mail it and you attach like $1 right to it and it's it's not that someone's trying to pay me a dollar to take this survey but it's now i feel indebted to this person too so when you give them some sort of a gift or whatever to some degree they feel a little indebted to you and just as jackie mentioned they they like you that much more right because you helped them out or you provided something to them for free or whatnot and it and it's really hard for humans to to not do those i mean that's why like coupons and stuff work right I, I can't let this thing go. I can't, I got to use it, right? And when you don't take advantage of something, you really feel like you missed out. So that's why these kind of things are really great. Uh, one also, it, and it probably could have been mentioned up above with having the website, but I see it out here a lot where I live out here in the country, is uh, a lot of people, and I see it everywhere, maybe it's, I'm just old, but they'll use on their email, on their business cards, they'll have an email address like their Gmail account or a Yahoo account or God forbid, an AOL account, uh, you know, have the domain that you is your business, you know, the email mine's Joe at the automator.com, right? Ha have the email address tied to your business. It just makes you look that much more legitimate. If you don't have that, how can someone trust that you're actually a business that's going to be around for a while? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, that one is a great one. It, it just ops the ante of it. It, it really does, uh, put that extra nail in it. Uh, seeing a gmail on a business card or something like that it 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 hurts the eye a little bit it it just takes away it, it could be anything most people understand that people might have a gmail or a hotmail or an outlook or whatever it is or an at and I, I don't know aol yeah but actually having your domain it it really if you have the website to hosting down all that stuff the email will be there as well and you know what you can set up an automated uh, uh, forwarder and it can go to the email that you actually check there, there's no reason for you to not use that option it, it's just do it yeah. Or you can, and you can also pay a little bit of money and have Google host your whole domain and email address and have it go through there. But the other one I wanted to circle back to is the whole point of this uh, podcast is talking about, you know, helping you build a strong consultative business, things where people are with any luck going to pay you money for. 
And so, you know, you want to come off legitimate. And if you're not doing, yeah, everyone, I'm sure we all have Gmail accounts, right? We all have other types of accounts. But if you don't have a work account tied to it, you know, again, I think it just takes away from your legitimacy, which also gets back to how much can you charge, which we've covered in some other uh, podcasts. But it, it nicks away at, at the what people, the value they see that you offer. The, so charging a premium becomes much more difficult when you don't have all these things we're talking about. Yeah, and it is just that extra thing, having the website, being consultative, uh, having testimonials, providing relative information, having a bonus. If you then just offer them a Gmail, right, it, it just kind of doesn't uh, uh, measure up to the rest of it. And, and it kind of goes into the next point as well, right? Be confident, right? Don't come off too needy, of course, but just be confident in you know this, right? It, it, there, there's a reason they reached out to you because either your website or someone else or video, whatever you did, convinced them that you might know. Why then shouldn't you come off as someone who knows? Because you probably know. So there's no real reason not to be confident in, in that aspect. Yeah, and when I used to, a long time ago when I was interviewing for jobs, I was told after the fact, they're like, man, you interview so well. And they're like, you were so confident. I'm like, because I, I know, I know what I'm doing, right? And it comes very cross, very clear. But it was, they, my, you know, new bosses would tell me later, like, that was one of the big reasons why they hired me. You know, that was for a job. But I think it's the same thing in consulting, right? And if you come off that you, you you're competent, that you are very knowledgeable and understanding, uh, then chances are they're, they're often going to hire you because here's the truth. There's a lot of really uh, incompetent people out there that have no clue what they're doing or just are problematic. And people love dealing with someone that are experts and they're going to treat them right. Yeah. So so the uh, number eight here that we're on is, uh, which is a simple one, but I, I like my favorite example of this is just how well Southwest does it, right? When you fly Southwest Airlines, Anytime there's a change in the plan or whatever, they respond, they let you know immediately. They're very good at communicating. So when people email you or, you know, call you, whatever, try to get back to them in a timely manner because it's, it's when people, you don't respond, you know, timely, people really start wondering what's going on, even when you're busy. Now you don't, you can still just get back and say, Hey, I'm really busy right now, but I'll, I'll come back to you hey, even Monday or by Tuesday next week, right? It's just, Get back in touch with them right away, telling them I'm gonna I hear you and I'll address your responses later, but I'm just you know, I'm too busy at the moment. But if you don't do that, it's a big black hole and they just were gonna go somewhere else. Yeah, there there is quite a few surveys and, and I know and I don't remember all of them, but if it's on the phone, you have such and such uh, an amount of time to respond. And if it's on email, you have like 24 hours, unless it's on a weekend oh. and stuff like that. Because people just have that uh, um, expectation. I'm contacting a consulting firm or consultant, and you should respond in a timely manner for them to keep uh, considering you as a professional. It, it's, it is a courtesy, sure, but you still need to do it if you want people to keep coming back and expecting you to, to be there for them. So absolutely, that it's, it's, a, it's a dead thing. It just needs to be done, absolutely. Uh, and sure, as Joe said, it, it's, it's a simple thing, which is just so important, right? The quicker you can actually respond, the happier the client would be. That's that's my take on it. Yeah. And and <laughs> we have the ninth one here as well, which is fire half of your clients. And it's it's, it's <laughs> sounds crazy. crazy. Yeah. It, it it does sound crazy, but it, it's something we've brought up a few times. It of course depends on which clients you have, but if you become busy or if you are having a hard time of actually responding in a timely manner and stuff like that, fire half your clients, right? You, you need to be able to actually cover the ones you have well. 
Yeah, but and, and I know you meant this, Jackie, but let me let me stipulate here. It's not a random half, right? You fire the crappy half, the half that are the whiners, the half that don't pay you, the half that ask you to do everything in the world. And no matter what always happens, even though it sounds like good intentions are brought up in the beginning, at the end of the project, you, you're like, God, I wish I had never known your name, right? There's no reason to keep going back to these people find other people, find other consultants that you can direct them to and say, hey, Bob out here, you know, he, he maybe he can help you out and just, you know, push them away, which actually ties into the next one. So these two are very linked is look for whales. There are customers that you have, you know, there's the, was the Priority rule, uh, rule of thumb where 80% of your money comes from 20% of your clients. And you can actually flip that where um, 20% of your clients represent 80% of the work, right? And that's what we're talking about is lose those guys that are way too much work for the money you make. Go out and profile the ones where it's far less work, but you make a lot more profit, a lot more money, and then go find more like them, right? It's it's really a great thing to do. And it just, we get caught up in like every client is the same and they're worth the same. And the thing is, they're not. Right. And, yeah. and there's just some that have a lot of potential. Yeah. And, and we've caught a, covered a few different ways that I've, I've had this in. And, and one of them is in, in, in support of actually selling a piece of software to people. And um, I at one point had a free trial and it meant that right. I was using 80% of my time on people trying to do something for free. And the people who actually ended up paying, um, they'd probably figure it out themselves. And stuff like that, just it's all around, right? Uh, actually looking at your clients, finding the ones that are just hogging all your time or energy or whatever it is and cutting them, it will probably make you much more happy and in the long run probably get, make you more money. So, yeah. Yeah, and actually, Jackie, I'd I would I'd love to follow up on what you just said there because it's some really good stuff. And it's not that you shouldn't give away free things entirely, right? Because free, free gets people. But mm -hmm. perhaps you should just qualify the people you give the free things to, right? And in one of these seminars from Dan Kennedy, I was listening to it, and they basically said, hey, for those of you, and I'm going to make up, I don't remember the stats you said, that are, you know, have businesses with over $100,000 in sales and have 100 employees, whatever, we're going to ship you, you know, a free version of our book. And, you know, just let you know, but they'd have to qualify them. Those, and then they literally said this, those that um, don't match these qualifications, you can order the book here. And then they just made them pay for it. Right. And it was like, it still made it available, but they, you know, they, they just didn't give them all the extra love. And I thought I'm like, that's brilliant. Right. Is some of them, you can still make some money on, they might be okay, but why not really treat the ones that have the most potential better. Right. And, and it just made a lot of sense because also when people come in for free, often they're, they're not ideal customers that they often end up wasting a lot of your time. And it's really weird, but it's, it's the darn truth. Like the, the Udemy courses, we know we have several that are six that are paid and one's free. People complain about the free one, I think, more than the other ones. And it's because people are signing up without paying a penny. And then it's just, that's just the way they are. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's weird. It works both ways, of course. I, I Was it a um, quick access pop-up where there was at one point um, a, a paid uh, version of that? And... Um, the owner of it, it kind of was like, yeah, now now I'm feeling tied on uh, hands and feet because now people's expectations becomes something else. So so sure enough, you can keep something shareware or free or whatever you'd like to call it. And, and then you can, of course, not support it in that way. And of course, if you start taking a premium for it you probably need to expect people to also expect some kind of support for that and stuff but in generally i'd say fire half your clients the ones that are whiny or whatever look for the whales in your client um, tell so yeah absolutely you know I'll, I'll finish up with one jackie and i don't think you'll mind me saying this but um you we you sort of alluded to it earlier 
and it's something that I don't think many people know that that you and I started making our videos and and webinars and everything and podcasts back in the day. It was part, we wanted to be kind of you know noticed and have a, an alertness around us, right? Be known in the community, right, amongst people, and. So we started doing the webinars, you know, and part of it was for that. And then we want to, um, I know both of us want to help people, but it become, you know, become an ace, you know, a very credible person, you know, teach people and have the expertise and you'll find people come to you like crazy. Right. And and that's where it's like, Hey, go create a podcast on your topic. Right. Or, or do some lectures or have YouTube videos. The great thing about, I have, I have over a thousand YouTube videos now demonstrating. I have at least some sort of clue how to automate things. Yeah, I, I have had a website for many, many years, and I still get contacts uh, re uh, regularly. I Less because it's less updated, but I still do get them. And it, it just means that if you have something out there, people where they can learn about you, and uh, you've made different types of things, it, it will keep going for a long, long time. Well, and actually, to follow up on that, Jackie, um, in another different Dan Kennedy, it's actually a, a course I have on him on finding whales, and so it's, it's a really fascinating course. But he talked about <clears throat> a lot of people that do advertising and marketing, they do it to try to make a sale, right? And it's all angled at making a sale. But he said, here's a good hint, even a lot of people don't like doing it because they don't want to lose the focus. But have, and I forget how he phrased it, because it's, it's, it's important how it's phrased, but it's okay. I can explain it. It's a uh, have a lesser, um, a thing that doesn't take where they have to reach out to a salesperson. You know, they can go a less intrusive thing. They can go look at a website or read a document. You know, these things are, are not a big deal. Like I don't, hey, I don't have to call and talk to a person, right? Cause, oh, that's like a commitment. I'm just not ready for it, but I can learn a little more, right? So when you're doing stuff, have another way where they can learn that's not such a big risk or this big amount of effort they have to do. Um, and your, your, whatever you're doing actually has a much better chance. I think they called it wide net fishing, getting, getting, bringing more people in. And of course, then you got to filter on the ones you get in and really give the love to the, the whales. Well, awesome. All right, yeah, man. Absolutely. Bye, man.